one of the things that I'm trying to do is to talk about what it means to be in an era where in the life sciences, the sciences themselves are always already considered ethical. So we don't have to fight a fight to say, oh, there's social or political or ethical things. They're, they're already considered to be ones that have ethical issues um, in them. Um, and one of the, and those, those range from um, how to store people's information, how to store bioinformation, how to store, and that, that's those in, which involves a lot of design considerations, as I'm sure you're, you know, um, how to um, deal with uh, the people who are donors to the enterprise, how to deal with intellectual property, whether or not it's okay for the public to, to subsidize basic research when the point is for it, for the biosilico revolution to occur and for it to be the new engine of private enterprise. Um, so, so, um, the, so what, I, what I looked at in that book are a lot of the discourses that, make, that, make, that both handle the ethics um, and the ways that you make it into something that's ethically mandatory in a way. So in the area of regenerative um, medicine, I, I, I called it procurial. Um, and by that, I meant that, it's, that there's a great use of, the, of procures rhetoric. So how can you say no to things that will produce cures? Um, so, and then if you have a bench to bedside idea of innovation, then anything you're doing on the bench will go, is going to the bedside if we just fund it right and organize it right. And a large part of that is if we build our buildings right. If we have the right buildings and the right funding, and it's no surprise that the architect of the Proposition 71, the California proposition that's funded stem cell research to the tune of $3 billion over 10 years that the book has as a central case study was a real estate developer. Um, so um, not only are we in this era of, of science porn bu building real estate porn, but, but also um, the, the way that these, it was a, a way to develop all kinds of building space, but also to model these ethical issues. Um, the design of, 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 uh, of, of big data, of databases, of, of contact systems with patients and things is something that's really interesting to me too. I was just focusing on the building part here, but I'm, I'm really interested in all of that. But if you decide that, the, that the, you're going to give an ethical man, you're going to say that something is ethical in a way that were you to say no to it, you would be unethical. What, you're not in favor of cures? So yes, you're in favor of this entire economic system, this entire reframing of what science is around that. And then the way that we manage, so I sit on a couple of ethics committees um, to do with regenerative science, and the way that we manage the ethics of stem cell research. So in the US, the problem is around the abortion politics. It's around the embryoid nature of uh, some of the substrates. Um, and so embryos, embryos are posited as being equivalent to human subjects or animal subjects as needing some kind of ethical regime for their management. In fact, the majority of the population don't think they do, so what ends up happening is that, that, that these committees, these, these embryo ethics committees, end up being ways to just make sure that you got the, got the embryos, the cells derived from embryos, in a way where you weren't responsible for the embryo side. So it becomes all about procurement. So if you think of genetics as being all about provenance and procurement to some extent, Regenerative medicine is all about procurement. It's all about how you procure this. So that was the second procures thing. And then the third is this extraordinary rise in biocuration. Um, you have to be able to keep track of these cell lines because they, it's no longer possible to, um, it, as, the, as the biological specimens interface with information, it's no longer possible to anonymize them. We can trace them back to their individual donors. And indeed, the state that thing that seems to kind of vanish in the innovation framework is actually there really strong, strongly all the time, partly in the funding system of the taxation that pays for this basic research, this ideology, but is also there in the forensic realm where they're using the ability to um, bio, to biobank and to trawl for familial uh, members and for uh, identification and exoneration as becoming part of the surveillance and forensic state apparatus. So, um, 
you, so anyway, it's all, all of which to say that the that the ethical certain ethical templates become the ones that are manifest. Certain ethical solutions um, get get uh, propounded, and they they give you things you can talk about, and then they also give you things you can't talk about. Um, so there's you know there is an, there it's it's the people science as uh, my student Ruha Benjamin wrote in her book. Um, it's you know it was voted for by the people at stem cell research in California. It's for cures that affect everybody, regardless of your of your uh, of your um, circumstances of your birth, in theory. Um, and yet, uh, you can't talk about uh, things that are outside of that kind of bio innovation frame, or at least it's incredibly diff difficult to. And I document some examples of this. So, for example, our fights to get. Um, cures that might arise from this research to be available to everybody in a country without um, national health care has been and continues to be incredibly difficult. And what fiscal model do you have unless you have this ideology of, of it moving, moving to the market um, and uh, so on? So, so I hope that goes some way to answer the question. Question in the second line, third line. Hi, my name is Giuseppe Testa from the, from the STS team of the European Institute of Oncology here in Milan. Mm. So thanks a lot for this very stimulating talk. I was wondering whether you could elaborate a bit on the relationship between um, the design as you sort of framed it in terms of uh, architectural spaces mm. and the design of the epistemic cultures. And I'll try to specify what I mean. It seems to me that um, you made uh, a point in all the three uh, buildings that you told us about of the different way in which uh, the collaborative space is imagined uh, and implemented with, uh, you know, with the idea that the free flow of ideas should be implemented and should be actually fostered uh, in these open spaces, the open labs, and, and so forth. But of course, with some notable exceptions, I think that uh, we all realize that uh, when it comes to publishing and to actually crediting uh, intellectual work, the structure of who ends up being responsible for an epistemic claim is still remarkably uh, traditional. So I was wondering to which extent in your empirical uh, analysis uh, these different uh, architectural spaces actually mapped onto an actual diversity of epistemic cultures or not? Thanks. Yes, thank you for another excellent question. Um, so. Uh, so definitely you see um, that, for example, in Biopolis, it, yes, it matters to publish sci scientifically for all the ones that are, are research teams per se, but it's also really important to get products to the market. And it's all really important to, um, to attract uh, innovation and international uh, exchange and so on. So the sort of economy of bringing people from around the world is also really important. So that's also part of the epistemic culture. And the way of inviting people and setting out the lab in a way that um, can, you can pick, take your pick and do, um, and you can collaborate with um, people who might take your, take your work and develop it, a, a building over, is part of that epistemic culture, that idea that it, it will flow like that. The Sainsbury Laboratory, um, and, and this won't surprise you, it's implicit in what you're asking, so um, for, uh, actually on Thursday, I'm going to be um, part of an advisory committee for an inquiry that's going on at the moment into scientific culture in the UK. And it's being headed up by Ottilene Leiser, the head of the Sainsbury's laboratory. And um, they're trying to um, promote the idea that you can have, that you can be nice, that you can have a much less, that you can do excellent science um, in a much less competitive way, that you won't be um, you won't be uh, uh, susceptible to all the pressures of the uh, publish or perish, um, and you don't necessarily have to publish in the boutique journals to um, make it uh, in the field. Um, so she's been explicitly supportive of, and they use the they use the area of the lab the fact that it free flows like that to say that our meetings are not being, are not secret. Anyone can drop in who has the intellectual interest, so you're driven by the intellectual interest. So it's a, in a way it's partly an older model coming through, but it partly it's being reinvented for the, for the, for the newer time today. Um, and 
it's, uh, and, and they're trying explicitly to set themselves up as something that um, would counter the, that, the epistemic culture that's more typical at the moment that, of the tradition, the way that we've, we've fo we focus so much on the, the, on the big journals. Um, but having said that, as she herself recognizes, it's all important that it is the top plant genetics lab in the world, and it's in Cambridge. So yes, you can publish in PLOS. You can, you, can pub, you can publish in an open access journal, and it doesn't matter because you published from there, because you were already hired there, so you must be truly excellent, and so on. So it's, it's as you say, there's a tremendous recalcitrance, and we also all find, as scholars, as we're being, we're being um, bombarded daily with, please publish here and please publish there, that you no longer have that sense that the place that, that if you read something in a journal, that peer review means very much, so there's a huge crisis of reproducibility at the moment, and you no longer have the sense that um, uh, that there's going to be it means any that there's any quality imparted. So as we go crazy in the U.S. and the U.K. and I'm sure in Italy to to start to try to measure impact beyond impact factors, um, we, we're fetishizing them at the exact moment that they're absolutely collapsing because it, there is a crisis of it. Um, in the Crick um, lab, uh, the you know, it's Paul Nurse is the, is, who's going to step down from Royal Society and move across to, um, to the Crick. And uh, as you know, Paul is very interested in, um, in participation, but up to a point. He's very interested in transparency. Um, he's very interested in getting it done. He doesn't have any, he's a very straightforward kind of a person. He doesn't have any particular problem with industry or anything like that. So his main idea, and you see this in the way that it's set up, it has almost that panopticon thing. It's that the public are invited, except it's the public, not the state, who's invited in to look. And they look, and they can look and see that, yes, we're just transparently getting on with our work, and, it, and anything else is, is noise. But we, we, need to, we, need to, we need to produce, we need to encourage industry. We don't have enough uptake of industry in the UK. We don't have, so absolutely, you see the epistemic culture. There's a lot of, a lot, I'm putting a lot in the charismatic leaders of these institutions, I realize, in my answer to you. But it is, it's a combination of the way that the spaces are designed, who they choose as leaders, and the kinds of spokespeople that these leaders then become for these spaces. So they're absolutely all co-producing one another. And I think they represent really contesting, contested and competing models at the moment of where we're going to go with the crisis of reproducibility, crisis of publishing, and the crisis of the public and the crisis of the public good in the life sciences. I have a certain sort of... Well, I, I didn't expect it at all to listen to a lesson of architecture uh, and um, uh, it, it was very interesting, really. I'm an architect. Uh, I've been trained as an architect. I know all the examples you've shown. And um, the, the very first question I was asking to myself while we were talking, mm -hmm. obviously I, I didn't have the opportunity to, to see these buildings, even La Jolla. Uh, I, I, I never been to the West Coast. Uh, but the, the very first question is very easy, and it is why all these labs should be designed as if they were temples. Why do they have money? Why do they have to show the aspect of monuments? This is my very sharp question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also in really enjoyed the comments you made earlier. It really clarified for me the connection with design much more, so thank you for that. Um, the, so, you know, again, I think that these buildings are monumental in different ways. I think the Sulk is monumental in a, you know, as I said, in a Cold War way, in a frontier way, in a, you know, in all of those kinds of ways that I think these other buildings are not. Um, but, uh, it, you know, the, the quick and dirty answer is that the reason that we're in the era of science real estate porn right now is there's so much money in science. 
And there's so much money in life science. Um, and it's, it's not just big pharma. I mean, it's, it's, well, it is big pharma, but it's everything. It's the, the, the value of it to the military industrial complex. It's the value of it in, in all sorts of ways. It's also a time, of course, of incredibly interesting market failures in the life sciences. So we keep seeing synthetic biology and regenerative medicine fail and then companies rise and fall and so on. But there's an enormous enthusiasm for it, an enormous amount of um, venture capital that, to be raised. Um, but it's also um, the way that we think of what it is to be a citizen now. It's what we think that our cities and our nations and our international space should be. We think you know, every country is lamenting the, the failure of training people in the STEM disciplines. Um, science, technology, engineering, and maths. Everybody, everybody has this deficit that there aren't enough people in these fields. Um, and, uh, and everybody has this idea that you can, um, it and it completely ties to the financial situation, I mean, the having of money, but also the ideology of the having of money, the idea that you can become, um, that what the era, the, the life science era we're in is one of unbelievable um, income inequality um, while being um, healthier and having a longer life expectancy than in the old bad old days, so I, I think that the they they are um, and they're temples in the sense that I think it this sort of newer sense of vocation really resonates this idea that you do it for the love of it um, that knowledge trumps God that knowledge trumps the market and so on but it's it's but only within its limits, and that's kind of what I, what, I was trying, what I was trying to argue. But absolutely, I think that most children going into school today, and it, so my students in California, in particular, more than my students in London, will um, not only think that the best thing to do is to become, the most successful life is to become very, very rich through science and technology, um, but they also think that the best way to be good is to become very, very rich and then get out of paying tax and give your money to a pet project that creates markets so that you can become even richer. So th they think that's the model of the good and it's the model of how to live, what a successful life is that's so trenchant and so, you know, it, it has its temples. This is, this, is the, the, this is the God that these kids, but it's more than the kids, it's, 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 our, it's our society and it's very seductive. Um, a quite, and then a, the science itself is just so incredibly amazing right now. Incredible stuff is happening. So that's the scientist in me speaking. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much, Karis. That's Christine Leuenberger from Cornell University. Um, it was a very stimulating talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I'm interested in, uh, for you to reflect on the connection between what's happening in the life sciences and what's happening in the social sciences. You mentioned mm -hmm. that the buildings in the life sciences reflect the way we think about science in terms of participation, sustainability, and interdisciplinarity. And certainly in the US, in the social sciences, there's increasingly a move towards more engaged research and learning and participatory models of learning and teaching. And I just wonder, what is the connection? How do you see the connection? Are we in the social sciences just emulating what's happening in the life sciences, or is there a sort of a co-production going on? So I really appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, that's, thank you for the, another, another excellent question, um, which I suspect that you could answer a lot better than me. But um, uh, thinking about your wonderful work on um, epistemic differences on either side of the wall. Um, but, uh, I mean, the first thing to say about real estate in the social sciences is that by and large it's a complete afterthought. Social sciences, maybe not quite to the extent of, of um, humanities, have, uh, typically live in you know, the ugly parts of campus, with the exception that we are now seeing enormous real estate investments in big data. And everybody doing big data wants social scientists there too. 
Um, they, it, and, it, and that's the Google effect in part, but it's also the idea that you know, we can finally crack this um, barrier of understanding these aggregates called human beings um, now that if we can only retool our social science, qualitative and quantitative, to deal with big data. So I'm seeing buildings, nice architecture going up around social scientific data centers at the moment. Um, the participatory thing, I mean, I think there are, there are ideas about um, democracy and equality and things, but I think that they mostly have a longer history in the social sciences already. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, and I think it's, it, it, there's still a lot of effort to, to differentiate yourself from you might as well just be a journalist to, rather than an effort to have the public understand. Um, but the, the, the call to people to be, um, be socially relevant and to solve big issues, I think, is across, across the board. So not, not a very helpful answer, but some reflections. We have time for a last question, if someone has something to add. Okay, I will ask you something. Yes. Because I was just thinking about something that maybe is not uh, completely relevant. I, I've been to a, a book presentation a couple of weeks ago about this uh, new kind of green buildings, and they were talking about this idea of greenwashing, because if you see the distribution of how a green building can be called or can be labeled mm -hmm. as a green building, mm -hmm. then what happens is that if you have a number of different standards and criteria, at the end, all this building will just be pushed more or less on the 51, which is the way to get the label of green building. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about this, and I was seeing the, your presentation of these buildings as a way to use a kind of science washing, mm -hmm. so that you are presenting, let's say, the good science that is monumental in some way mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. representative in the way, in a traditional understanding mm -hmm. of science, we are represent not we, but I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, science is represented, while the dirty work, the labs, the real, how can you say, work in practice are just kept, uh, let's say, invisible to the eye of mm -hmm. the, not just the public, but also other people that could be engaged. So I was just thinking if this could be, in a way, maybe it's a brave interpretation of what you were mm -hmm. saying, what mm -hmm. was just mm -hmm. asking for a comment. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that, that's a stronger and braver way of putting what I was saying, that they have, they have these ideals in them, but they also really represent the limits of these ideals, the limits of the participation, the limits of the sustainability, the, and, and so on, in, in the way that these buildings are. And I could have said a lot more about the design of these buildings, um, how they achieve, achieve their greenness, and, and it's, it's there, you know, you just try to get to some threshold, but you're still using so much more electricity than anybody ever did before for the life sciences and, and, and so on. Um, I think the, the kind of, it's the same old, same old as going on behind closed doors thing too is having, having a certain amount of that skepticism I think is appropriate. Um, and I, so one of the things I've been attending is some of the Royal Society events on reproducibility and open access and things over the last, and, and the US government are holding some of these committee meetings and things over the last um, couple of years. And um, it's, it's very common to have somebody from um, industry in the room who um, knows more about, has better science than anybody who's in the public sector doing the science. So I, I, I sat at one at the Royal Society on open access, and it was a guy from, now I'm going to get it wrong, I think it was BP, but I mean, it was somebody who really was involved with the science of a, a petrochemical company. And he made some statement along the lines of, well, if, if, if you could actually see the data we have on geothermal energy and la, 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 la. It's sort of the assumption that there is this massive, and we know this too from climate models, most of them are proprietary. You know, we, we worry, you know, and um, so much of military science is absolutely a cutting edge, but absolutely secret. So between being secret and proprietary, and then between the public science actually just sort of keeping the public at the door in a way, just looking in maybe for transparency, um, I think the idea that um, it, it, 
it, it's still invisibilized in all kinds of ways is ab absolutely right. To some extent, it has to be if you believe in the if you believe in the innovation idea. If you believe that you have to keep it secret because that's the that's the spur to innovation, um, then then you, it has to be. If you believe in national security concerns, their research has to be secret to some extent. Um, and if you if you and as as the the person in the audience said, you know the traditional way of publishing and the way that we get credit, you can't be going around saying, oh, I just found X because you'll be scooped. And that is, doesn't do justice to you or anyone that works in your lab or anyone who funded you. You've got to keep it under wraps. So the pressure is, in fact, to be open, participatory, transparent. You know, it, it serves certain political functions at certain times, but there's an enormous limit to it. And, it's still, and it continues to run up against its own enlightenment ideal, that it is eclaircissement, that it's the, it is the throwing of the light or the opening up onto knowledge. Um, but in so many ways, it's not. Thank you. <laughs> A very, very last, mm -hmm. if it's short. <laughs> Excuse me, but I was thinking about an aspect. I'm uh, Alessandro Mangili from the University of Padua here in, in Italy. And uh, uh, which kind of uh, judgment do you have in um, thinking about the, the transformation of the anthropological basis uh, of the um, scientist. I mean, do do you do you explain do you sh do you display this this uh, transformation in architecture and keeping a, a certain monumentalization? Um, we know that, for example, from the Stephen Chapin book about. Uh, um, the scientist, uh, we know that uh, the image of uh, the scientist is very changed uh, from, from a previous monumentalization to the, the, the idea of fun, uh, to the idea of entrepreneurship. And uh, did, you, did you find some parallels in, uh, in your um, architectures? With, with this anthropological transformation of the scientist? Excuse me. I'm just, yes, absolutely. Um, that's very interesting. Um, the, there is an enormous importance at the moment on these few charismatic megafauna, these few heads of departments, heads of these very big figures on campuses, at least at the places that I've worked closely with. Um, and uh, those figures, uh, there, there's, a, there's, a range, there's a range though, there, I mean there's a, there's a, the, I mean definitely the spaces themselves are more entrepreneurial and many of the scientists are, but you don't lose the idea that you do it for the love of it. And you don't lose the idea that you, you would be doomed if you ever follow the money. You have to follow the idea and then go to the money. Um, so there's a great acceptance of the innovation idea, but you have to do it through being the best scientist. So there's still a lot of that old, older anthropological idea of the scientist still alive and well. And it's very important in training. Um, and um, the, um, you know, this, these crises around fraud and, uh, and so on, a lot of it is used, used as a moral lesson to, to describe how in people, you know, if you just try to get fame or whatever, if you bypass that, if you bypass the, you know, the scientific method in this very uh, old-fashioned sense, and you're no longer that anthropological figure, then you, you won't succeed. You'll bring your whole country down. You'll bring everything down around you. Um, and the, the space, too, is like that. So the space is this very invisibilized, private space, you know, this, these spaces that are very, you know, just, they're just temples to knowledge, but then they also are, absolutely, just go across the spy, sky bridge and then it will be entrepreneurial, it will be taken up and you won't have, you know, you won't have all these patents that, that uh, you know, you won't have patent thicket problems or you won't have things that, that, that there's no uptake and they enact these marching rights so the states can go in and take any invention after a certain while and, and make sure it gets to market. So it's this kind of balance of the two and the space is, is a balance of the two as well. Um, and, but as to having fun, um, it's having fun in that very 
Peter Pan way for some men that you don't grow up. But I don't see many women scientists having fun. And most men scientists aren't having fun. They're having fun when they're playing ping pong and their whole families come to have dinner with them at the, on site. And they love what they do. So there is that, again, this revival of this, uh, you know, and they're, they're, you know, they run. And they, but even they're having fun, like the, the social activities and the downtime activities, like when you see people, you know, in the Bay Area, people, these Silicon Valley types, they're always running, but they're running with biomonitors all over them, and they're running for health, and they've got the right gear on. It may not be elegant or fashion, but Milan style, but it's, uh, but it's um, you know, everybody's, you know, they walk with a capital W, and, you know, so everything is, is self neoliberal and self-monitoring and self-responsibilization. So, so having fun, maybe not so much. And then there's a lot of differences by rent, race and gender and so on. There's still a tremendous amount of stratification within science. Thank you. Thank you, Caris, very much. Now we are going to... Yeah. <laughs>